Um, welcome everybody. Um, we're really excited to have this session here today because uh, when something is called Brangelina, it immediately sort of incites uh, excitement uh, given the media frenzy times we live in. Um, that said, we do want to uh, question uh, something that concerns us all, especially as Indians, um, or perhaps especially as global citizens, the idea of marriage is all around us. Uh, the marriage is happening, the marriage is collapsing. Um, there's so much excitement about the collapse or the happening of a marriage. And um, let's, let's talk about that today. But uh, one of the things, one of the key questions that comes with this uh, forum today is, does marriage have a sell-by date? And um, given that we've taken this subject so seriously, we've taken some good care to get some very eminent people here. Um, to start with, um, Dossie, um, has, Dossie Easton, um, who is a marriage and family therapist, has, has written The Ethical Slut. Um, it's a fantastic title, firstly, but um, um, there's something genuinely radical about what she does profess through her works. And um, um, through her works, um, Dossie has been, uh, I think, fighting very hard uh, to to sort of uh, discuss how to live an active life with multiple concurrent partners um, in a fair and honest way. And um, given um, how can we as individuals find non-monogamous ways of living. So she is obviously going to have some very clear-cut ideas about what marriage is or is not. Um, on the other side from the West um, uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, we have Prue Leith. Uh, who's uh, probably best known as a food writer and television presenter. But uh, most importantly, why she's here is truly special. Uh, Miss Leith famously has found love again at 76, which I think is a beautiful thing. And uh, she's all set to get married. Uh, in an interview, she said, I'm getting married and I'm giddy with the joy of it. It's deeply embarrassing for my children, but they have been great professing delight or perhaps relief. Um, going back to the past, uh, 42 years ago, when she was 34 um, and nine months pregnant, she did find her way uh, to the marriage registrar's office then. This is 42 years ago. The lift was not working, so she actually climbed all the three stairs, nine months pregnant. And when the registrar saw her, he famously said, don't worry, dearie, I'm also a midwife. So um, I'm sure... Uh, Miss Leith will have some very interesting things to say about marriage. Um, closer home, we have stand-up comic Radhika Vaz, no stranger to us Bombayites, because she has been uh, very active in the male-dominated world of stand-up comics. Um, researching her uh, this morning, I came across an interview with her in Vogue, uh, in which obviously there are witty responses, but this one truly took my breath away. And um, they asked her, what is the idea of a perfect marriage, uh, to which she said, in which the spouse is very rich, very old, and very sick. <laughs> so um, I'm sure Radhika, too, will have um, some perspective on this. Um, last but not the least, uh, we have with us Sudhir Kakkar. Um, as a psychoanalyst, I think Mr. Kakkar has been involved in sort of like um, with our troubled lot for so long, we're such a strange people, we're obsessed with marriage, we're also repressed, and he, he just, he has the entire gamut there for us. Um, so we will ask him some questions in terms of why we're obsessed, what the issues are. Um, the panel is going to be fairly straightforward. I'm going to throw common questions to our panelists, then some specific questions about their work and then we will throw it up, open to the audience. Um, so let's begin. Um, my first question to all of y'all is, um, who are we kidding? Um, when we, let's question the very question of this panel. Uh, when you say something like, does marriage have a sell-by date? Um, is it a very people like us sort of forum where of course we can question it and think of ourselves as, oh my God, we're so cool and liberal where we are gonna take this institution and toy with it. But at the end of the day, it is a millennia strong institution. Entire countries are obsessed with it. Some countries are fighting about like, um, like the laws to get married. Um, how do you see marriage as it is at this point in our history? Do you see some radical changes in the format 
in the coming years. So I'll start with you, Ms. Pruliet. Um, well, what I think about marriage is that the sad thing is that young people seem to want a wedding without being committed to a marriage. And the, certainly in the United Kingdom, they will probably have two or three marriages, two or three weddings and not very good marriages. Um, so I think uh, we've got it wrong there. I, do, I, I sadly feel like you're right. There's a group of people that we can afford to say that, you know, we don't want it or we don't need it. And, uh, and then there's a much larger group, I think, that doesn't always have that liberty, especially talking from an Indian context. You know, as an Indian woman, I think having the choice of even girls from like educated modern backgrounds being able to actually look their mum or dad in the eye and say, you know what, I don't know if I'm going to get married. I'm not even sure how many women in our audience here feel brave enough to do that. So, yeah, it worries me that it's almost a fear psychosis of being alone or watching your kid be alone that drives us to keep pushing this agenda. And I have lots of other thoughts on it, but yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. <laughs> oh, you have one over there. Okay. Um, I think that our relationships are changing. I think that modern relationships are different from what they used to be. What a marriage used to mean was that people, and really a union of families, not even just the two individuals in the couple, got together to arrange for the security of the family into the future. Agrarian marriage was about doing all the work of tilling the fields, planting the seeds, weeding the gardens, getting the harvest in, um, shearing the lambs, weaving the wool, carting it, spinning it, all this work had to be done. And so people gathered together and those commitments needed to be for life because otherwise people would starve. Now we enter into marriages for very different reasons these days because most of us in most of the people at this conference, I suspect, live in circumstances where if their marriages fell apart, they might have a little less money, but they would manage. You would all manage. Um, and so now we see, I think, that people feel free to leave marriages in which they are not happy. Um, and this is a remarkable freedom. This is probably the first time in the world that we've really been able to look at things like this. I think that we are looking toward a time of a much more open notion as to what kinds of relationships we might have, an expectation that we will have several in our lifetimes. And I would also point out that we say the word marriage, and we think we all know what that means. But I don't think we all have the same relationships. I think we all have very individual and different relationships. And so I don't know if there is any institution that really describes what we may choose to do. I'll put that to you as a question to think about. I believe that uh, marriage was an institution, I think the best devised institution up to now, always questioned, which serves three basic human needs of adult human needs, sexuality, intimacy, and parenting. It fulfills all three needs. Now, in each individual, the proportions of those needs are different. And each individual also has a mix of those needs, which is different. And you have the other partner who also may have a different mix of needs. So to get them all needs to serve together is a difficult task. But then, of course, uh, uh, it can be that one need is, uh, is satisfied so well that the other two needs go down. And these are all individual ones. At the moment, it seems to be if your sexuality is very highly satisfied, it's okay, I'll deal with the others. Uh, and the, the thing is, uh, always, uh, the marriage works like happiness if you have low expectations. If your expectations are high, that all three needs are going to be at the satisfied, the highest level, no marriage is ever going to work. Wow, that, that, that's, that's something to think about. 
Um, I'm, com I'm coming back to the uh, sort of uh, media-fueled idea of marriage. Um, something very strange happened yesterday. I met a colleague at the Times of India, and she was like, oh my god, I'm so excited about Brangelina. Do look up, look up Kim Ye. So I said, what is that? And she said, well, it's uh, a merger of Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. And while doing research this morning, I was actually not sure how you pronounce Kim Kardashian. So I go on a YouTube link, and there's somebody who just says Kim Kardashian. And I was like, Vishwas, uh, this is the end. But like, I couldn't believe what I was doing. But it was sort of interesting where we find these neologisms uh, that merge uh, sort of uh, celebrities when they get married. Um, but there's so much intense scrutiny. And all of you all are from the media in a way. You know, there's so much intense scrutiny that falls on um, celebrities, you know, and that sometimes um, those marriages end up collapsing as well. And um, I want to pose this question to you all that is that all, I mean, like, how much of a role does the media play in this sort of scrutiny and also fueling our own obsessions with being married? Our TV serials are all about that. We have a genre called Saas Bahu. Um, even when Brangelina ended, um, there was this, this conjecture that he's, he was probably um, seeing Marion Cotillard, you know, who acted in Macbeth last. And then she just said it never, um, and they were like, how are you being so calm about this? And she said, I never take anything personally when it doesn't concern me. And in a way, the media was disappointed, but it does uh, sort of bring to question um, how obsessed we are with celebrity culture and how something like marriage comes under tremendous pressure when you are under the glare. And uh, do regular people just see that as a prism to look forward to, or is it just an exaggerated like play? I also feel like the media gives us what we want in some sense. Like, I do believe that having babies and getting married is like the height of femininity. And we've been pushing it down women's throats for ages. And at one point, you know, shadi shadi was like a big thing. And that was always in your face, whether it was a celebrity or anybody else. And so we were encouraged to want that type of thing too. But now, and then for a long time, the Bollywood and the Hollywood ladies would go away and have their babies and then come back with a baby. But now we're glamorizing pregnancy and everything. So I don't know. Like, I feel like there's some sexist shit going on. And this is just part and parcel of that. Like, I think it's being glamorized so that we do more of it. I think there must be nothing worse than being so famous that you can do nothing in private. You can't walk down to the supermarket, you can't be seen on the beach, you can't... It's just, it must be absolutely dreadful. But I do think that deep in our subconscious, we have this desire for... From little children, we're taught about princesses and princes and, a, a, you know, um, finding love, whether it's Cinderella or Snow White, it's always about happiness in the end. And that is what we fundamentally desire, is happiness. And I think there is, I mean, you, you mentioned that I had found love late in life. Well, I have to say that I'm 76 and I got married a month ago. But we have been together for five years, so this is not some teenage madness. But I think that in the end, we decided to get married, although we didn't need to, and in fact, we still live in separate houses, and it's, it's perfect. But we did it because I think that, that those words, you know, to have and to hold from this day forth, for in sickness and in health, until death us do part, uh, they still resonate today. They are what we want. It's a kind of ambition, and getting married is a public commitment to I'm going to try and make this happen. And I don't think we should lose that romance. I, I mean, I write romantic novels, and they're not, they don't all, always end happily. They're not romantic in that sense of it always having to be perfect. But everybody strives for that. And I don't think we should knock that, because it's so deeply in our culture, and we all want it. No, go on, have a go. No, let them finish. Then I I, I have to challenge something. Why in heaven's name would we believe that the goal of having love, intimacy, sex, and indeed security can only be achieved by marriage? What if there's a thousand other ways? 
Recently, I had a huge surgery on my spine. It was such a big surgery that I was delirious for the first week. I didn't know where I was. I kept forgetting I wasn't supposed to get out of bed. My daughter, who's 47 years old, and an ex of mine, someone I dated 24, 20 years previously, decided to take turns sleeping in my hospital room. When I got out, many, many other people, I have a lot of lovers, many other people came and brought food, they came and helped me. Uh, when I was coming out of the hospital, I was in the hospital for a month, when I was coming out of the hospital, I asked if there was anybody who had a guest room in San Francisco that I could rent so that I could have some place without stairs and so much driving. And a person I broke up with in 1979 had a guest room for me that he decided it would be neat to provide me with a healing sanctuary. And many more of my friends and lovers showed up there with uh, food and with friendship and music and love because one of the things that you can do with a polyamorous lifestyle, with an open lifestyle, is you can build a village. And that's a lot more secure than one other person. I think I'll challenge that. <laughs> uh, but it's, of course, my, my opinion. I think uh, the need for, let's say, intimacy is one of the needs. Uh, it doesn't come immediately. It takes a long time to build up. And that's why sometimes it is antithetical to the sexuality because the familiarity which intimacy wants is not, it goes together with the mystery and the newness which sexuality wants. But to leave that aside, but to go through that part of getting that intimacy, there is the intimacy, what is the image of intimacy in us is to have a two-person universe. All the rest is outside. Uh, I think Dostoevsky put it uh, very well in one of his lives, to be seen by the other person as God sees us. Now that is not a need you can have, uh, be polyandrous or polygamous with. You cannot spread it out that way. Yes, of course you can. If you don't have that, fine. The other one is to me a compensation. Uh, if you can't have it, all right, let me spread it out. But I think that need of that oneness is very important. And, and the second part of the cultural part, which, which is never mentioned in uh, in Western writings at all of the of intimacy, that there is something also beyond in intimacy. Now, I would put the word spiritual in it. Uh, now, spirituality is not a good word in the kind of modern audience, but uh, we are, I'm not talking about the acme of spirituality, of uh, the mystical union. That is the summit. But to go to the summit, you need to develop some kind of qualities. The first step to that is, first base camp is tolerance. And the second would be empathy. So to, to come to that one. So just to develop tolerance and empathy, actually marriage is the part where you have to develop tolerance and empathy. So those are qualities which you develop in a long relationship, not otherwise. So tolerance, empathy, etc., are not qualities which you can develop in relationships which are fleeting. The, the fleeting relationships are maybe sexually satisfying, in you know, all kind of it. But to develop those kind of what I call spiritual qualities, you need a long relationship. Yes, of course, if the relationship is bad, not, that, not to have the suffering at all, but to go through that. There's a T.S. Eliot line, uh, a man, a person joins himself with the universe if he has nothing else to join with. And I think he's quite wrong. You cannot join with the universe unless you have joined with someone else before. I just want to say, so you know, uh, uh, I also have a book, by the way, everybody, it's called Unladylike and it's available in the bookshop, please go buy it. But one of the things I talk, uh, I, I don't talk about this much in my stand-up, but I, I wrote a lot about it, was my feelings around getting married and how I really at one point felt like I was unable to distinguish between the feeling of fear of being alone and the feeling of love. Like I literally had a problem trying to figure out whether I was just afraid of breaking up because I didn't want to be on my own and being alone and it's such a bad thing, especially in Indian society and everywhere in the world. I lived in New York for 15 years and girls in New York were concerned about being alone at 35 and it's a horrible feeling to have to keep explaining to people that you're okay being single, like singles being a freak or something like that and being married is normal. It's like, I'm not going to be normal till I get married. That's really how a lot of us feel. And it's wrong, you know. And I couldn't tell the difference. Am I, do I love this guy? 
or am I frightened of being on my own? And I, I, I don't know what it is to this day. I'm still with him, but, and I'm glad he's not here. No, he's read my book. But that's the thing. I feel like we have frightened people into believing that marriage is the way forward. And if you don't have marriage, you're less than. I really believe we've told people that, and they believe it. Um, coming back to what you said, Radhika, like this fear of being alone, but um, like just as marriage is significant, something like divorce, like when a marriage ends, we call it divorce, is significant. Uh, will we ever reach a point where um, we are sort of developed enough to just be like, hey, it's a marriage, it gets over, um, and a divorce is like a form of a breakup. You know, like when you break up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, it's a breakup, you move on. But divorce has a certain ring to it. Is it a cultural thing? Will that culture, with the cultural shift that comes with newer forms of, or ideas of union, will that change over time? I'm posing this to all of y'all. Can divorce just be seen as a breakup? Because it isn't. As long as we start seeing marriage as just another relationship, yeah, then divorce will be just another breakup. But as long as we're like, oh, marriage and, uh, you know, like I know somebody who told his daughter that he was keeping X amount of money aside for her wedding. Then she told me that she wanted to go abroad and study. And I'm like, hey, great news. Your dad just said he had all that money for your wedding. Don't get married. Take the money and, and run. And so she went to him and he's like, no, 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 no. For that education, I'll get a scholarship. So until we change our minds about that, divorce is going to be this big, horrible bear. Do you know what? I think divorce would be quite a good thing for quite a lot of people if only they'd keep away from lawyers. It's lawyers who make divorce such a difficult, impossible, ruinous. Well, maybe and mother-in-laws, and maybe father-in-laws. <laughs> but, but I do think that it ought to be possible for grown-up people to leave each other without ruining each other's lives. But it doesn't seem to happen. can too have intimacy with a whole lot of people. <laughs> I, I have to say that, sorry, I have to say it. I also want to point out that we imagine, like the, the Hieros Gamos, the sacred marriage, we imagine that's always with a man and a woman. One time I met a man at a ritual who was uh, obviously one of our California Tantra people from what he was wearing, and I, we talked, and I said, I belong to a woman's Sangha, and he said, you can't do that. Uh, you can't do kundalini yoga without a man and a woman. You've got to have an innie and an outie, or it doesn't work, right? And so I, I mean, admittedly, he was embarrassed. I said, but I just told you I do. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, excuse me. But uh, that this notion, I, I like to keep opening up these boxes. I don't like being trapped because it scares me. The family I grew up in scared me. And I don't want to have a family like that again. I don't want to be, have those walls so closed in on me. So that's my personal bias and why I'm attracted. So I keep finding other ways. I do know one thing. If you want to build intimacy in your relationships, don't be afraid to tell the people that you care about, that you like, that you love, that you share sex with, what you like about them. Be affectionate. Let them know that you care about them, that you think they're wonderful in this way or that way or the other way. Don't let it be a sort of a go out to the clubs and pick up a one night stand sort of thing. Because I don't think it's much fun having sex with your armor on, frankly. Um, coming back to what you just said, Darcy, um, there's been so much debate in America with the whole gay rights, um, gay marriage union sort of debate. And one of the criticisms that has come the way of the gay community from some quarters, not many, is that why would you want to mimic an institution, firstly, that has excluded you, and that has left so many heterosexual people so miserable in some ways. And what is your take on that? And everyone's take on that, for that matter. Well, I do certainly identify as queer, and that's been very important to me because it's been part of how I could explore a very expanded sexuality and sexuality and spirituality as well, but also because in 1969 I, I figured out that um, that I was telling myself I could only be half a person because I was a woman, 
In particular, I wasn't supposed to be too intelligent. That was against the rules. And so when I moved into a queer lifestyle and an open lifestyle, I had the space to be everybody I wanted to be. And I could find people who enjoyed doing things with the different parts of me. Does that make sense? I could find a, a match with people over different things. And it gave me more of myself and it gave me more depth in the relationships I was involved in because there was an interdependence there. It's a different kind of interdependence. And being queer to me has also like taken me way out of a lot of very con conventional assumptions about what men and women do. Uh, uh, when I talk of marriage, I don't talk, uh, I talk really of couples, so it doesn't have to be man-woman couple. It can be any couple, but I think all those three needs are common to all the three, the three needs which I mentioned earlier. Uh, you were talking of the, talking of the strains which are going to come in our marriages here. The strain is coming because couple has become now much more important than the old family part, which where marriages were between families, now couple is becoming primary. And that, of course, is going to create great strains. The first strain is to expect that all your needs are going to be satisfied by the couple, which were otherwise distributed among the family members. Sometimes you, someone you could talk to very well, some, uh, even the sexual needs. Uh, in, the, in the larger family, sexual relations were with your uncle, niece, etc. So they were kept within the family and now they'll be outside the family, which means much less accepted. So there's going to be a great strain about that also, of any kind of uh, uh, adultery, which was okay when within the family. So these are kind of things which are going to be strained. But we have to, I think I welcome it, that we were too much in the family part, familism, and, but I also think to go too much into the coupleism, that the couple is the most important thing, I think can create uh, what is called a folie adieu that nothing else is important, no one else in the world is important except we two, is I think also an exceedingly false position which you can get stuck into, which I think lots of Western marriages did. Um, I'm now going to move to like sort of specific uh, questions based on some of the writings you'll have done. Um, you know, and um, Dossi, uh, I mean, uh, so Mr. Kakkar, uh, in a 2007 article in Little India, you wrote, Perhaps the greatest attraction of an arranged marriage is the fact that it takes away the young person's anxiety around finding a mate. Whether you are plain or good looking, fat or thin, you can be reasonably sure that a suitable mate will be found for you. Although physical beauty is important for the Indian girl, it does not command the same premium as the selection of a partner, in the selection of a partner as it does in Western societies. Um, that was 2007, we're talking about 2016. Has, has your stance changed or um, does, it st does that fundamental truth still remain? Um, Sorry. Did you want to say something? Hmm? Yes. I think the question was for him. Was it for him? The question is for you. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, no, the, the, the stance is still the same. That. Uh, uh, but it is, of course, changing now because with the importance of the couple part of it and the family not going to find the boy or the girl for you, so your, so your looks become extremely important to the delight of the beauty industry. I mean, that is going to go up a lot. It, it, was, it was pretty low at the beginning. So that certainly is there. So I don't have any kind of value judgment on it, uh, but uh, yes, it it's is the truth. Like that's, that's how it stands. Yeah. Um, then, um, in another thing, um, Dossi, your book cites the sexual revolution and free love of the hippie era. And then you mentioned uh, how the gay world opened your eyes. At the same time, um, Prue, um, how, how is Britain placed right now? We know about what America is going through. But with Britain going through this whole Brexit, uh, sort of that, this new conservative uh, conservatism that is sweeping much of the Western world, do you see marriage going up? It's seen as a conservative institution in many circles. Um, I don't know what the statistics are, but I do know that the, the wedding business is rising amazingly. Everybody does want to get married um, in a ceremony and wear a dress and all that nonsense. Um, but I think there's something quite important about this business of arranged marriages because 
You know, when you're at your most dangerous, it's between sort of 16 or 15 and 23 or something, where, let's face it, we all did amazingly dangerous things at that period of our lives, all of us, because that's when you are most indiscriminate and most led by sexual drive. If somebody is beautiful looking, you just fall in love with them. And it doesn't really matter a toss if they're not good people or if they're... So I'm not sure that we ought to have a sort of universal rule that nobody gets married till they're 27 or something. Because I think that one of the things that an arranged marriage, and I'm not for, for one minute recommending a, 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 arranged marriages, but I, I think this, we shouldn't forget many, many arranged marriages work really well because the decisions are being made by grown-up people, not people whose frontal cortex haven't quite joined up yet and who are driven by sex. So, you know, arranged marriage is not all bad. And I think of the times that my parents, who were, um, you know, I was brought up in South Africa and I was brought up quite strictly, but, I mean, my parents saved me from many a disastrous relationship because they just would not let me do what I wanted to do, which was run away with people. And then I grew out of running away with people, or wanting to. And Radhika, I had a very good marriage. Radhika, what is your take on the arranged marriage? I mean, there's some, there are two proponents here who say it's a good thing. Yeah. What is your take on it? Uh, I actually remember, and I think I've written about this too, like I remember in college there were all these, in college, like we were 18, 19 years old and there were girls who would be like, they'd come back from a weekend, I was in the hostel, they'd come back from a weekend at their local guardians or whatever and they'd be all about, you know, I went for the shadi and my chachu just, you know, grabbed me and took me and he wanted to introduce me to so-and-so family's son and then that, someone else wanted to introduce me to this other person. I was like, where the fuck are my parents? Why aren't they doing this for me? You know? And yeah, there was definitely a moment where I was like, this doesn't seem like such a bad deal. I would be less desperate if my freaking parents were on the job. Uh, but they weren't. And so that's, that's where we are now. I, I didn't say I was in favor of arranged marriage. Okay. No, no, no. no. Okay. I was giving the good points of arranged marriage. Yeah. What the difficulty in arranged marriage is, the, the fantasy of love. Where does that go to? So that went into our situation in the Bollywood movies. So all our love fantasies were in the movies while we did our arranged marriages. So it's not, you miss that out too. No, sorry, sorry. Maybe I got that wrong. But uh, coming back to uh, the same article, Mr. Kakkar, uh, one of the things you mentioned is the sort of ma the tension between the two poles, the universal love, dream of uh, passionate erotic love and the cultural reality of arranged marriages continues to persist, so it's a tug of war. Um, is, is, is marriage in a, way, in a strange way a manner to just tame your more carnal instincts? Like, okay, you want to like, just have fun with everyone, this is the one person, now you make do with this. And uh, does it collapse when you sort of stop negotiating that, that sort of like corset and you're like, that's do a large part of marriages just collapse based on, on um, this sort of like, no, it's not just one person, there ought to be many. And I, I pose this to all of you all actually. Okay. Um, I have learned that great sex and great romance is no predictor of a long-term relationship. Uh, some things are meant to be fantasies, and sometimes you can bring fantasies into reality, and that's really great, and that's not the sort of thing you want to share a mortgage with. Um, it, to, to, so arranged marriages, I've often thought, do have certain advantages in the sense that you're talking about what some polyamorists call a nesting partner, a partner that you choose to build your financial security, to raise children with, but then to keep that alive, uh, one of the things that really works is open relationships because if you have other people that you can invite into your relationships and have join your family as adult lovers to members of your family, then you develop this extended family of people that you have chosen to be, make family with. And children can be raised like that proverbial village. Mm, but Radhika and I'm more like sort of conservative society like India where, I mean, open marriages 
open relationships. I mean, you talk about, and they exist again in that sort of uh, celebrity realm that people, the, the urban legends that we always hear that, oh my God, unki to, unki to tum jante ho and all, unka sab chalta hai and all. But actually, we still live in a fairly structured society. Um, how do you see um, this tug of war between uh, the Indian woman getting more sexual, sexually liberated and this, this idea that marriage is between man and woman? And yeah. one partner. I mean, I'm definitely all for open marriages. I'm not sure I could actually, my husband and I could actually make one work. I'm, I'm, I, I definitely think it's a great conversation to have and I'd be so curious to have more of that with you. Um, because, you know, it, you, it's, it's such, in my opinion, it's so revolutionary, you know, to not have jealousy and to not have ego and to take all of that out of your relationship, uh, I, I think is revolutionary. I'm not a revolutionary, so I don't have that. But do I support it? Yeah, if someone else could. It's, I, I think we may be a little ways away from that in India. Like you said, we're such a conservative country. Uh, women right now are just fighting for the right to make a choice one way or another, uh, let alone, you know, have the liberty to take it a step, a step ahead. Uh, I definitely think uh, one of the things about, I, I find marriage to be, in India especially, very sexist. It is, it is really, I feel it benefits men more than it benefits women. And there was an interesting study that I came acro across that said that women initiate more divorces. I don't know if that's 100% true, but they do. So that tells you something about how unhappy maybe women are in marriages. Um, in terms of uh, conservative society, we don't even like same-sex couples in India. We, we, we still haven't got there yet, most of us. Um, and I think that let's just get there. Let your, your son choose a man or your daughter choose a woman and then we'll get to open. I can't even imagine my mother's face if I was to be like, I have two boyfriends and that husband and come over for dinner. That would be fun. I'd like to try that. <laughs> uh, I wonder if uh, things go so smoothly in open marriages. I mean, from at least my experiences, uh, that one really underestimates the darker parts of what sexuality and desire is, and the darker parts are possessive desire, stabbings of jealousy, possessive of, in a way that uh, that is all I want. Uh, also guilt, what am I doing? So it is not that uh, it is so open part of it. It looks open, but uh, what are you feeling inside? The desire or sexuality has its darker parts, which don't go away just because of the institution we change of how you deal with it. And that, I think, is a problem. That's why we're discussing it. Marriage through the millennia has had the same problems all the time. Sure. Um, is there any way to like, sort of extend the sell-by date? Um, like, you know, um, where if we, uh, we assume that, oh my god, here, here's an institution. It's meant to be you're married to someone. It is going to go sour at some point. But let's extend it. And um, I mean, um, and is there like a sort of uh, innate sense of denial, which I think Indians are very sort of conversant with, you know, uh, the idea of just inner immigration and you take it all in and just, um, what, in, in what manner do you extend the sell-by date of a marriage and um, what are some of the solutions? And I'm going to ask each one of you what you think um, is a solution to keeping it going. And our audiences would love to know that. I don't think one size fits all. I don't think anybody can sit on a platform and say this is the, this is the way to live your life. It's not right. I, I think there are hundreds of different solutions and we, the best we can do is be really tolerant about what anybody else wants to do. Um, I have to say for myself that I think that there are, um, there's a real advantage in, in late, geriatric love, shall I call it, geriatric. And that is because when you get a bit older, you are actually more tolerant. I notice your, your um, what did you say? Um, older, angrier, hairier. I understand all those three things, but I think the angrier might not always be true. I think, um, I mean, I am certainly far more relaxed today than I was when I first married. And I think, when I first married, and I had a very, ha very, very happy marriage, I was very, um, not subservient to my husband, but I really looked up to him. I mean, I thought he was, 
He was 20 years older than me. He taught me a lot. I was definitely the junior partner in the, in the relationship. And I mean, I, I said sort of laughing earlier that I've got the perfect marriage now because my husband and I live in separate houses. And for older people, guess what? Separate houses is often a very good idea. Now, I don't say it's always possible, but the best thing about separate houses is you don't have to deal with the clobber that comes in a marriage. I mean, most quarrels in marriages are about trivial things. They're not about real things. They're about why don't you put the toothpaste back, top back on the toothpaste? Why do you, um, why are your record, why have you got hold of the remote control? Why, have, why is all your clubber on the floor? You know, it's the stupidest things you quarrel about. So if, as you have now, as I luckily have now, my husband gets up in the morning Goes down, makes me a cup of tea, goes downstairs, feeds the dog, and then goes away to his, ho his house to do his ironing and clean his shoes and get his clip. Because all his stuff, I, don't, I haven't married his stuff, I've just married him, and all his stuff is in his house. It's brilliant. I really do recommend it. Uh, yeah, I, I, my husband and I don't live in the same city, actually. Um, but it depends though, right? Like sometimes that brings its own set of challenges, not living together. I definitely think there's an interesting thing about how all of us are choosing to be married. So while marriage looks like it's not going anywhere, I think the way in which you can be married is going to be individualistic. Like each of us now gets to make our own rules. So whether it's an open marriage, whether it's with the same sex partner, whether it's to have children or not have children, whether to have your sister come live with you guys because hey, guess what? She doesn't feel like living wherever and you're uh, not a threesome exactly, but you know, you have a different, it does doesn't matter like I think we can all start to change the traditional rules around what a marriage looks like so if you don't live in the same house for example that's something that might make your marriage go longer than it, it, you know it might have if you had to live together I don't know I just think the rules of marriage and how marriages appear from the outside are changing and to me a happy marriage is really where the two people or the five people involved um, don't are happy like, they're happy in their state of affairs, and it may not gel with what you think a marriage looks like, but that shouldn't really matter. And uh, longevity of a marriage, yeah, I mean, live separately, have, have lots of your own friends, like, have your own thing, I think. I, I think successful marriages really work when, I don't know, man, I know what I'm talking about, my, ma my marriage is hanging by a string right now. <laughs> I, I have no solution at all. But just a couple of things here. Uh, I think uh, we overestimate our, our powers over our unconscious minds. I mean, what we are talking of is what we all like, our conscious minds. But we really have a whole from generations, nature, and our own say, things going on in us which we don't really know of. We cannot control it that easily. Do that, and that's fine. So, so I think we should need to be careful. The other part was uh, that. The trivial, I mean, I don't think any quarrels are trivial. Uh, I mean, though, to me, if you're fighting on the same of who cleans the cat's kit litter uh, it, for a long time, I think there's, there's some other thing behind it. It's like this patient who say, comes to the analyst and says, I wanted to tell my mother last night at the dinner table, pass the salt, and what I said was, you fucking bitch, you have ruined my life. <laughs> you see? So, so that was the underneath. So, so I would, doubt that part of it. Uh, how to do it? Well, I, you, I think, quite right. How to increase our tolerance, empathy, and if, if it doesn't work, fine. But do, I think, do examine what is unbearable. Which of my needs are becoming so, so unbearable to identify that need, that that has become so strong in me, what do I do about it? To identify and then see whether it can be done. If not, yeah, fine. I think I want to say something that you might agree with. Um, you know, all those movies end where the boy and the girl go off and they get married and they live happily ever after, right? Or the boy and the boy and the girl and the girl, it doesn't matter. They live happily ever after. That's what they're supposed to do. One of the things I think is most miraculous about intimate relationships is that it forces us, it wakes up in us, it opens the necessity for embracing our own shadows. 
Um, the shadow is the term Jung came up with to talk about those parts of the mind that we had kind of sent off into exile because we were afraid of them or because they were too painful or too overwhelming. But when we get that intimate with a the person, then that kind of thing opens up. And that is one of the greatest values to me of intimate long-term relationships because when we are able to become conscious of what had previously been too scary, had, we had forbidden to consciousness, then we keep growing. We keep changing. We keep getting more integrated. We keep healing. We resolve fears. And we do this often with each other in, very, in, in what can be very strange ways. And sometimes it's not pretty, because it is shadow. I mean, we're talking about the dark stuff here. But often that may be the stuff which does keep people together, the chance to keep working on becoming whole, on becoming an integrated human being with all my parts in my consciousness. That's one of my big goals, and relationships help me do that. I think I quite agree. <laughs> At the end, I mean, you need the other to become an I. Um, we're now going to um, uh, put the question out um, uh, to audience um, who can um, sort of address our panelists um, regarding this. Uh, we got somebody here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so basically, uh, I have a friend who got married somewhere around uh, when she was 23-ish, and it was a love marriage. And we have been discussing so much about arranged marriage and love marriage. And one of the first things she told me was that how she felt um, betrayed when she first got married. Because usually when you're in an arranged marriage scenario, you sort of have this idea that this is what you're supposed to do and this is what's going to happen. But what she was trying to say is that she thought that he was a modern kind of man who is not supposed to be, you know, who wouldn't have the same expectations that a guy in an arranged marriage would have. And in a relationship, he did continue to be a modern sort of man. But the second they got married, the, and the second they entered this institution of marriage, the same rules of marriage started to get applied. The idea that, you know, now that you, you're married, you clean the house, you take care of this, you take care of that. So I think we were discussing that why do so many love marriages get so frustrating and you know why do they keep on ending? It's because in arranged marriage we come from that idea that okay this is how it's going to be but in love marriage it kind of becomes a huge betrayal that this is not what I signed up for and now this is what I have in, you know, with me. So what do you all uh, think about that? Okay, can I, okay, so whether it's an arranged marriage or a love marriage, uh, men and women, we have no business being old fashioned and expecting women to perform gender roles. Whether it's arranged or whether it's love, that shit needs to go, number one. Okay, so any of your arranged married friend, friends who are putting up with that, by the way, you should tell them not to, like just go stir, shit, stir the shit. Uh, I just want to say one quick thing that I've noticed, and I don't know if this is true at all, but this is my theory. If you're expected to change your last name, expect a lot of other sexist crap to come down the pipeline. The mo no, it's true. If you have a mom-in-law or a dad-in-law or a husband who's like, change your last name, why isn't her last name changed? Red flag, ladies and gentlemen, red flag. That's a big one. If they don't expect you to change your name, I think you're on pretty solid ground. Okay. I um, want to. Oh, yeah, that's I, I a good point, add, actually. Can I add something very brief to that, sure. please? I do notice that I really believe this: that one of the differences between men and women is that men are raised to expect that when they grow up, they will have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Please. Uh, where's the uh, Where's the mic? Uh, now I I belong to a much older generation. And uh, this is an observation that about, say, 50 years ago, you know, it was quite common for a man to take three or four wives. They all lived together very happily. And these dark forces of jealousy and desire that Mr. Kakkar was talking about probably existed. I do not know how. But they managed to have a harmonious life. They raised children. That was quite common before the Bigamy Act came in. 
and before it was this couple business and so on. I remember, <clears throat> I mean, I, I haven't seen it for myself, but it was quite common for a man to have two wives or three wives at the same time. And the children were brought up so well, they had no issues at all. They did not think of themselves as stepchildren or of that woman or this woman. And the women of the house got together, cooked, uh, did things, uh, you know, which an ordinary housewife would do. So it, it, it is quite an intriguing fact that today we have come down to the fact that a couple means that it's only a man and a woman and there is a lot of jealousy because if the woman says, look, I like this man because he looks good or something like that, and then the man says, no, you can't say that to him, you're married to me or something like that. And then the man, of course, is allowed to have a glad eye probably in India, but the women uh, today also object. They wouldn't like to say, you know, that, uh, oh, how did you find that lady attractive when you, when you haven't paid too much attention to me? So I was just wondering how they manage those forces of jealousy or desire yeah. or whatever, because <laughs> it must have been a very important uh, element. Yeah. I think they manage it at the cost of the women. So as long as the women don't <laughs> scream, it is okay. So that was the behavior part of it, not screaming. It was but, a joint but, but family. You see the, but you see that in women's songs, where the pain comes out. In the Dadras, Tumris, etc. of North India, if you listen to the women's folk song, there's a lot of that pain comes out. And in the richer ones, in the Maharajas, for instance, 19th century, 20th century Maharajas, they preferred to have, uh, have relationship with boys because the children, if, who was born to anyone in the wives, four or five wives, there would be such a big problem about who inherits. So they, so they ignored the wives and had relationship with boys just because of that. So there was a lot of that stuff going on among the wives, who is going to inherit? My son, or the, and we know it from Rama and Mahabad, I mean all. So it is in our collective consciousness, which comes out in those days, but not in behavior, because uh, you get a danda if you do that in that time. Um. Uh, so uh, we've talked a lot about arranged marriages and all that, but uh, I just wanted to ask your take on uh, live-in relationships. That is a very common phrase these days. Actually, that's a very good question, and I'm surprised we never uh, brought that up. And uh, yeah, one of the solutions is like, why is there so much emphasis on marriage? Yeah. There's so many couples that just live in. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I'm not making a distinction between the marriage part of it. It's if the couple is a long-term relationship and goes through it, it to me is, a, is also a marriage. Yeah. So I'm not making that formal distinction whether the, they've registered the marriage or not. I, so I lived with my husband for about three and a half years before we got married and my family actually knew about it. My mom came, stayed with us and you know, she treated him like she would treat, you know, somebody that was very important to me and that would probably be part of her family. Uh, his family didn't even know I existed. Indian man. This is why I tell Indian women, if you're going to insist on marrying an Indian man, please make sure he's an orphan because it's the only way he's going to exercise any freaking agency. Um, let's get in the third row there. Uh, my question is addressed to Dr. Kakar uh, and ma'am, you said that uh, mal marriage or a long-term relationship helps you to deal with your shadows. In your opinion, is marriage necessary for a person to deal with their shadows? Can a person do that alone through, I mean, sir, you are a psychoanalyst, you, you uh, deal with, you know, clients and patients and so is it necessary, uh, is it so vital that uh, somebody gets married to deal with those parts? Can they not take that journey alone? Uh, you have to take, I think, the journey with someone. So you can say, you can take it with a therapist. It's going to cost you much more. <laughs> Persuasion, I mean, if you take a long-term journey. I'll also answer your question. I think you do need to get married to fight your shadows. I'm, I'm 42 and I've been single most of my life and I've become extremely eccentric. And um, maybe when you, <laughs> I'm just talking so much of it is about sharing how eccentric you are. And I think when you get, you're in a relationship, you are dealing with uh, your own personal weirdnesses and you're sharing that. And as, as Mr. Kakar said, that's how you grow and yeah. Um, I, Actually, no, I, w I wanted to make a related point, but, but perhaps it's not, it's a little bit off, off the question, but 
I live in the UK, which is supposed to be one of the most liberal, relaxed um, societies. And yet there are thousands of girls in their 30s who are desperate to find a husband or a lover or a long-term relationship. They want to find that man. And I think the reason that, girl, that girls struggle so with it is that basically women are not are very fussy about who they end up with. You know, they're, we're quite picky. We want, we want our lovers or husbands or boyfriends to be, um, I mean, I don't like to say this, but I actually believe it's true. They, we like them to be slightly more intelligent than us, slightly better looking than us, slightly earning more money than us, slightly. We want to look up to them, admire them. They've got to be Prince Charming. Whereas chaps don't really care as long as the boobs are right and the girl is willing. <laughs> Men will marry their researchers, their secretaries, their cleaners. Their, they will marry so-called down as long as the girl's pretty. Women are fussier and it takes them longer to find the right guy. But, but, don't, you think, but don't you think that's also part of like how we've all been conditioned that the husband takes care of you, so he has to be better, you know, better qualified. He has. I have a very close friend who's an architect. She's a successful architect. She has her own firm in New York City. She's 45. She's single. And I remember she and I were talking, and she's like, I would be disrespectful to a man who was less qualified than me. I was like, how can you be like that? Like, that's sexist. But it's part of our conditioning, and you're right. Like, I do think we women make it hard. But also, we don't have role models. We don't have that many unmarried single role models. Thank God now, I have a few role models of women who didn't want to have children. Otherwise, they're going to have to take children also. Um, OK, All we right. have time for perhaps two more questions. So there's somebody, there's somebody back there. It's hopeless. Hello. I've been changing my seat, at least for the last five minutes, to attract the microphone. <clears throat> I think I don't agree with most of what was said. I'm not married, but I'm very strongly in favor of that institution. To my mind, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. I came a little late, so I do not know what you said about Brangelina, but it's worth mentioning over here that Brangelina, that's Angelina and Brad were in a relationship for what, 12 or 14 years? And it was their children who told them to get married. <laughs> that proves that marriage as an institution is here to stay, point one. Point two, marriage is given sanction and sanctity by religion and society. One makes it a sacrament, and the law makes it a contract. I do not believe that open relationships, same-sex relationships, or whatever relationships you wish to call them, are going to be accepted in society. Because by and large, not just India, the whole world is conservative and traditional. And uh, stupid. Maybe. If they don't want same-sex. Maybe. Uh, as I said, I'm not married, and I'm not it's stupid. Not but anyway, what, this is what I was saying. The last point I want to make is, I just came from a talk, and there the lawyer said that when you compare love marriages and arranged marriages, most love marriages, she put it seven out of 10, end up in divorce, and only three arranged marriages end up in divorce, in the divorce courts. And the final point, our parents used to tell us when they wanted uh, to arrange the marriage that love in an arranged marriage starts with the marriage, whereas love in a love marriage ends with the marriage. <laughs> Thank you. OK, one last question. Um, there. Hi. Um, my question is kind of taking off from what you asked in the first thing, which is, it seems like uh, you have a lot of people, especially in the millennial generation, whereas, you know, the institution of organized religion or the institution of marriage or the rejection of being an engineer, you have the sort of this questioning, which leads to an idea, which leads to never going back. But you rarely have people who say, I'm an atheist and I'm I converted to Hinduism 
or you know, uh, I actually love engineering as I got older. So I'm interested in your take and what happens, is it that you know, when we're young, we're rejecting these ideas, we're questioning, and then we, we never really embrace it. Like, what, what happens? I feel there's a, in our generation, there's a, there's a fundamental rejection of institutions. It's Check. I think we need some new institutions because I don't think marriage is just one thing. If marriage is sacred, which I do believe for many people it is and for, and for real, then why do we need a license from the government? At least in my country, there's supposed to be a separation of church and state. Why is it that the government can tell gay people if they can get married or not? That doesn't make any sense to me. What I would like to see if we were really gonna open up the notion of marriage is that people had actual freedom of choice about what they called their relationships and they made contracts, not laws, but contracts about how they wanted to do their finances and you know all the other sort of things that you need to make agreements about. Your church could have a contract it wanted you to sign your, your you know, various books would give you sample contracts you could look at. We'd all be making the decisions about our relationships and the commitments we make to them consciously and choosing them if we stopped making laws about marriage. Uh, we wow. actually do have time for one last question. So uh, there's somebody there. Pretty entertaining and informative uh, conversation. Uh, beyond physical layer, you know, no religion has ever found an option for so-called marriage. Okay, and uh, there are books available and there are theories available where you look for a larger vision than a physical religion. Okay, and and when we are talking about marriage, do we ask ourselves? I mean, has anybody asked why I am getting into marriage? Most most of us get standard replies, you know, ho gaya. I want social security, I want children, blah, 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 blah. But when you go beyond physical layer and spiritual layer, it talks about repayment of your debts to your earlier generation, which is parent. Pitru run mukti ke liye shadi ki jati hai. 25 saal tak aap maa baap se lete ho, khana, peena, roti, kapda, makan, all that. And in Grahastha Ashram, we call from 25 to 50, you repay as a husband and a wife to your earlier generation for final emancipation in Van Prastha or Sanyasa Ashram, which we call Moksha or Vaikuntagati. Otherwise, you will be bonded in this stupid talks and continuous contracts. Responsibility comes voluntarily. Duties have to be enforced. Don't consider marriage as a duty. It's a responsibility. Have fun. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a delightful afternoon. Thanks a lot for being here.